of Oracle Data Guard Fundamentals. My name is Ray Cameron. I'm here with Andrew Dalby, the Oracle team lead at Extivia. Good morning, Andrew. Good morning. Uh, if you are new to Extivia, we just want to let you know we offer a variety of enterprise technology solutions and services that include business intelligence and data warehousing, uh, portal development, and of course, data management. Uh, we'd invite you to take a closer look at uh, Extivia and what we do at our website, extivia.com. And you can also see our, uh, our DBA-focused website, virtual-dba.com, to learn more about the, our data management services. Today's webinar, uh, you are, during, during the webinar, you're welcome to submit your questions at any time. If you've got something on your mind right now that you'd, you'd like us to cover uh, related to DataGuard, um, you're welcome to submit that. We'll um, look through those, and uh, our goal will be to, to answer any questions that come up before the, the end of the webinar today. Our presenter today is Andrew Dalby. He's been the Oracle team lead at Extivia for the past six and a half years and has a total of 14 years of experience with Oracle. I know he's eager to get going, so I'm going to turn it over to Andrew. Good morning. Um, before we get started, I just want to apologize first. Uh, I'm, I'm getting over a cold, so if, if it comes across, if my voice comes across poorly, please bear with me. Um, <clears throat> but Today we're going to talk about um, DataGuard, just kind of a, a 30,000 foot view of where it fits in the overall platform uh, of Oracle's high availability technology. And um, then we'll go through a, a quick online demonstration where we set up uh, a, a DataGuard instance for, um, for, for a simple database. So um, to begin with, Oracle has several uh, disaster recovery or high availability technologies that come with the product. Um, now, DataGuard is only available with, uh, with the enterprise edition of Oracle. Uh, some of these other ones are also uh, enterprise only, but, uh, but these are kind of the suite of, um, of technologies that Oracle offers that, uh, to, to meet the disaster recovery and high availability needs of, uh, of enterprises today. Um, and they're kind of arranged in terms on this slide of the, uh, the ease with which you can implement them and, the, and kind of the cost associated with them as well. So at the, uh, <clears throat> at the very basic level, we've got logical backups um, and then flashback database, then we move up to physical backups and archive log. And <clears throat> that's kind of a base level. Pretty much everyone should be implementing those four items. There's no reason why you can't do all of those. Those are all available in standard edition. And um, if your data is important at all, those things should be, uh, should be done. Then we start getting into the things that, that require um, Enterprise Edition and additional licensing options, um, and maybe additional licenses because it's, because you have additional servers uh, involved there. <clears throat> so, just as a oh, just as an overview, we'll start up and we'll talk about these things and how they fit in with DataGuard, and then we'll touch on multi-master application and rack a very little bit just to distinguish how those relate to DataGuard and how they're different. But obviously DataGuard is what we're talking about today, so the amount of time that we spend on those is, is going to be very limited. So <clears throat> when I talk about a logical backup, what I'm talking about is copying the data out of the database and into some other format where it's available for use. Um, that can be done by a variety of different methods. The, the method that is kind of native to Oracle is the, uh, the export utility. The export utility has been around for forever, um, but uh, and in more recent versions of Oracle, uh, they've migrated that to the export data pump as the um, as a preferred method, but the, but the traditional export method still is there. Um, 
We're going to look at that just very quickly and see what that looks like. So this is a, um, a very simple uh, Oracle installation, about the simplest Oracle installation I could do. I put it on Windows. Um, obviously, it doesn't matter if it's on Windows or Unix or Linux or, or whatever. Um, and we're going to look at the um, at the the demonstration schema that comes with Oracle, the Scott Tiger schema. So, if I were to just run an export, and I, and I've done that here, I just if I export just a uh, just the user Scott, we we get this dump file. And that dump file is then a logical backup of the Scott schema. And inside that, if you open that up, and you can't actually open up an export dump file. And there's a little bit of binary stuff in there to kind of guide the import process. But as you look through, it's mostly just a bunch of insert statements. And so so we're creating tables, we're inserting data. It's, it's essentially the, um, the total of the SQL statements that would be necessary to run in order to recreate the data in the database at the time that you did your logical export. There's a lot of advantages to having one of those, but um, so if somebody, if you, if you wanted to use that to, to move data from one platform to another, an export is a great way to do that. It's a great ETL tool. It's also great for, um, it, it, it's great to be able to um, back up a single object at a time. So if you want to just have a single table that you back up, you can do that with export. You can't do that with a physical backup. But um, but there's a big problem with that, and that's a snapshot. It's just a single point in time, and you, when you, uh, when you do an import of an export dump file, you're not re you're you're recreating the database rather than restoring the database, and so you can't apply your logs after that, and um, it could be organized on disk differently than it was before. So. That's something that's a great thing to have. It's kind of something you should have in your back pocket because um, there's a lot of things that that's useful for. Um, it, like I said, it has been supplanted a little bit by data or by data pump and also by flashback. So flashback is um, if you enable flashback database, you can query your database as of a previous point in time. So let's log into the database. And um, so if I, uh, let's say I select uh, star from department, oh. this is the, you know, there's the four departments that exist in this database. And then if, for example, someone says, you know, I'm going to uh, add a, an additional department. So I could uh, insert And we commit that. So now if we go back and we look in the, in the department, we, we see the new development department that's been created. Flashback allows us to look at a previous point in time. So if somebody did a big insert or they did a or they accidentally did a delete that where they messed up the where clause or something and it got committed, we can we can select from the department as of a previous point in time.
So as long as they're on, so uh, <clears throat> I just stood this database up yesterday, so it didn't exist a, a day ago. But an hour ago, um, we can see the data as it existed in the previous point in time. So that takes care of a lot of the issues that we would have used uh, an export for before. Um, and that then uses the, the flash recovery area. Now, <clears throat> the big thing is that's, uh, that's great for a single system. Um, we need to be able to, though, deal with what if the server goes down? What if, um, uh, so, so the logical export and the, and the flashback, those are great for, again, we go back here to the, um, to the our, our technology. These guys are great for uh, data mess-ups, if, so, if operator error kind of thing. Um, physical backups is kind of the, you know, this is the, the standard. This is what people use to, to deal with disasters uh, for forever. Um, and there's different ways to do that. Uh, we can we can do a cold backup where we just shut down the database and then uh, and then copy the files over because once the database instance is shut down, those files aren't being written to or read from. So those are we can just move that over. Uh, or currently, the best way to do that is RMAN. So we can do an RMAN backup and. Uh, and then we've got a, a, a copy of the database. So right now, we've got, I, I've already done a, uh, a backup of this. Last night, I did this backup set. Now, we're using Oracle Managed Files, so the file names are kind of ugly. But uh, what we've got here is then um, a compressed backup set of the database right there. And so, uh, the, some of the advantages of RMAN is that we can compress the backup set, so it's not uh, it's not going to be uh, take up the full size of the database. Right now, this database is about a um, we look in the the data files. This database is taking up uh, a gig and a, a third on disk. The backup is taking. Um, Just, a, just 262 megabytes. So it's, it's substantially compressed. Uh, it looks like we're getting about 5 to 1 compression there. Um, and then we can move that off to a, a, a safe third site. We can put it off to tape. We can put it off to a network device. We can put it off to a different server. And that's great. Um, then that means that if this primary system goes down, we can restore the database. This database is in archive log mode. So the archive logs are being, uh, are being created. Here we, we're, uh, we've got archive logs as, as it's going, so we can roll forward that, uh, that backup. Uh, and that's awesome. Except that you know, with, new, with modern databases, we tend to have large data volumes and low downtimes. So if we, had, um, you know, if we had a single database system set up and a single platform, uh, a single box ready to go, and the box died, we could rebuild that. We could restore it. We could replay all the logs. But we have to first acquire physical hardware, install the operating system, install Oracle, configure it, get it all ready. Then we can start our restore, which with modern databases, you know, this database is, is trivially small. But um, you know, we've got clients that have multi-terabyte databases. And it just takes several days to restore that. Even a, uh, even a moderate-sized database of, say, 50 gigabytes to take a couple of hours to restore. And then you've got to roll forward your logs. So you're looking at a, at a long downtime and with just a traditional backup as your, only, um, as your only disaster recovery solution. So what do we do? How do we solve that problem? Well, what we can do is we can pre-configure a system. So we need to have a secondary standby server with the operating system and the database uh, executables installed on that. Once we've got that set up, then, then the only thing that needs to happen is we need to restore and then apply the logs. And uh, so we can do that all pre, we can kind of pre-do that as well. So we can have a secondary system set up, all configured properly with all the software installed on it. We can copy this back up 
over to the uh, the, the uh, we can copy our backup set over to the, the standby database, and then we can restore it and leave the database in a, um, in a restore mode rather than, than bringing it up and open. And, uh, and then we can apply each of the logs individually. And I can do that by hand. That's just called log shipping, and that's, that's something that's, that's pretty easy to do. Um, and you can do that with any edition of Oracle. But you, uh, you have the problem that you have to manage that. So data guard really, all it fundamentally is, is a way to manage that much more simply. Let the software do all that management for you. Move that data over, get the, get the restore done, apply the log, and then continually run those logs uh, on, your, on your other side. So <clears throat> let's look at the architecture a little bit. On how that uh, on how that works and how that looks between the two systems. So on a on a standard standalone system running in archive log mode, this is this is <clears throat> how things work. You've got your production database. You've got the log writer process that writes your online redo log. As transactions come, those transactions get written to disk in the online redo log. You've got your secondary archive process, which archives those off into your archive log. And uh, well, that's just kind of how a, a production system works. So when we put data guard in the mix, we've got a standby database. The standby database is an exact bit-for-bit -bit copy of the production database. Every log file is exactly the same size and has every byte in the exact same location in that file. Um, we have what's called the remote file system. And depending on how you set up, Data Guard, you can set it up with either Log Writer or Archiver, sending off those ar those logs. So those logs can be written as they're written to the redo logs, or once the redo logs are, are switched, then Archiver can archive to the local disk as well as to the remote system. So the remote file system so process will receive those transactions as they come in, write them to the standby redo log. <clears throat> then you also have what's called the managed recovery process. And so the managed recovery process sees those redo logs and applies each of those transactions to the database so that it continues to mirror exactly the production database. So really what DataGuard is, is these processes right here, the, the remote file system, the managed recovery process, and then the standby redo logs. <clears throat> the rest of this we could just do manually. There's also a um, that I haven't written on here. There's also a fetch archive log process that if there's a if there's a redo log that's missing, we'll go back and look. So if there's a network connection problem, let's say logs, uh, you know, we had log one already applied on here, and we see log three coming in. RFS sees that log three is coming in. <coughs> Excuse me. And we'll write that to the standby redo log. But the MRP says, wait a minute, we're missing log two. So it'll kick off to the fetch archive log, or FAL, and say, hey, I still need log two before I can roll forward through log three. So FAL will come back over to the production system and say, hey, I need that log. And it will fetch it, and it will get it written over. <clears throat> so it'll, it will catch up any, uh, it will automatically catch up any gaps. So, even if your network between the two systems is a little bit flaky, or if your standby system needs to go down for a period of time, uh, you can just bring it back up, and DataGuard will automatically catch the system up. <clears throat> Obviously, that only works if those uh, archive logs are existing over here on your primary system. Fetch archive log can't it can't grab them if if you've already deleted those off the system. Um, but even in that case, it's not terribly difficult to uh, to restore them and register them with a the standby, and they'll get applied and, and um, registered automatically. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and do a, a quick go. Go ahead and start our uh, our demo and get an idea of, of how that would look. So here's our production system. It's got, uh, like I said, we've got our backup set. 
<clears throat> what these files are actually is this, this larger one is the backup of the database. Our man automatically will restore or will back up your, uh, your control file and your parameter file every time you do a backup because uh, you can't restore if you don't have your control file. It, your control file is what keeps track of what the um, system change number is in all of the database uh, files. So it, that's this. This is an automatic uh, control file backup. And then this here is a special kind of control file backup that you need to do in order to get uh, DataGuard working. That's a standby control file. So I, I've done a backup control file for standby here. And we can go through those commands again at the end if, if we desire to do that, if, if that's something that somebody wants to do. But <clears throat> here's our secondary system. And again, you can set it up so that it's a little bit different. Some people do run on their old server, uh, on their older hardware. They maybe do, uh, you know, they, they have their production system, then when they go to upgrade, they, they, they relegate their current production to their standby and then get another newer hardware for production. Or they maybe have disks laid out a little differently because they've uh, decided to go a little cheaper or something on that. That's not recommended. It's very strongly recommended that the standby hardware and configuration and layout matches the production system exactly. It makes everything much, much easier, much more robust. So um, that's what we have here is a, is a mirror system. Uh, this is exactly the same. It's laid out exactly the same. has exactly the same executables. Um, and we've mapped a drive to the other system. So this is the, uh, this is the C drive on the production system. So here's where that backup is. <clears throat> and so we're going to uh, move that over to this system. We're going we're gonna to copy our, our backup set to exactly the same location. As long as we do that, Oracle is going to quickly find it and be able to, to know where those backup sets are. You can move them, and it's, it's OK to do that if you need to. It just makes it a lot more difficult. So we're going to just uh, we're just going to do a robocopy and move that move all those files over. So we can set up an automatic job that will move the files over, and that's a, not a bad idea. My personal preference, even though I didn't set it up for this uh, for this webinar, is if you have um, if you have your two systems, and then you have a uh, an NFS share uh, somewhere else on the network. My preference is to do a local backup because then you can restore quickly. If there's in case of, an, of a problem on the local system, but then copy that out to your NFS, and as long as you do that through our man, our man will be able to find that out on the NFS point. And if you have it mounted on the same location on your on your um, standby, that'll all just automatically work as well. So now that we've got our our backup all set up, I have already pre-created. Um, a, an instance on this system that matches the other one. So there is a um, there's, there's another system here. So we can uh, the instance exists, but it's not started, and we'll need to start it up. Before we start it up, we do need to tweak the parameter file just a little bit. Um, we're going to do this in the simplest method possible, just because that's the idea of this particular webinar is to, to do this is the, the minimum, easiest way possible. Uh, and so we'll go into our Oracle home. And within the Oracle home, there's a directory called database. And on Windows box, in a Unix environment, it's DBS. <clears throat> this is a copy of the init file from the primary system. And what I've done 
is I've tweaked that just a little bit. These first double underscore um, parameters, uh, just in case anybody doesn't know, in the parameter file, the first before the dot, this is the uh, this is the SID. So this is for the Oracle SID. Um, star is for every SID that's associated with this database. That's primarily for rack. Um, we're not doing rack here, so that doesn't really relate to us. But the double underscore parameters at the beginning, those are um, automatically tuned uh, parameters that, that Oracle is going to deal with with automatic memory management. So we're going to just, we just deleted those. And then the only other thing that we've done, because all of our paths are the same, we set up our audit file destination and our uh, database creation file destination and our recovery destination. Since we've done those, then we're going to just let Oracle manage the files. Let them let Oracle create them however, however they want, or what it, with whatever names that it wants to do. The only other difference that we've done here, really, is we've added this DB unique name. Now, um, since DataGuard creates an exact byte for byte copy of the database, it is technically the same database. Um, so the database name has to be the same. But we have to be able to distinguish between the two different systems. So in order to do that, we have this other parameter, DB unique name. And this one's going to be Oracle Standby. On the production, we haven't specified that. So the DB unique name is just going to default to the DB name. So the production system is ORCL. And on the uh, standby, ORCL SDBY. <clears throat> and one more little note there, the, uh, the DB name is limited to eight characters. Uh, that is not the same, that you don't have that restriction with the DB unique name. So typically what I see is the SID plus standby or, or something like that to, to designate this. You, you might have the physical location because DataGuard also allows you to switch roles. So you might, instead of calling this Oracle standby, you might call this Oracle you know, uh, Los Angeles. This one might, the production might be Oracle New York. Uh, so, so the DB unique name is really the only thing that we absolutely have to set in order to get this going. So once we've got that, uh, once we've tweaked our parameter file, we'll create an SP file from that. Because we use the default name of the P file in the default location, we don't have to specify it. But if you wanted to, you could specify where exactly that was. You could have multiple P files and choose which one you were going to use to, based on the uh, the role that you're going to have that database playing at that particular time. And then we're going to start it up mount or start up no mount. So <clears throat> when you uh, when an Oracle database starts up, it goes through several different phases. Um, the first thing, when I connected up here, I just connected to Oracle. It had not uh, read any parameter or any, it hadn't read the parameter file. It hadn't configured anything. It's just the executable, Oracle executable started executing at that point. Um, when I start up no mount, that's the first phase that it goes through. And when it does that, it reads the parameter file, and it configures itself accordingly. So it will grab the memory that's necessary and uh, set up the different uh, memory pools. That's basically what it's done at that point. Is it's, it's figured out where the, it's parsed the parameter file and set up memory structures. Um, so now Oracle is available to connect to, uh, and that, that's necessary because we're going to connect to it from our end. So once we're done starting it up, no mount, and again, there's no way we can't go past that. The next uh, the next step in the Oracle starting up is to mount. At that point, it opens up the control file and it starts doing its cross checking to make sure that all the system change numbers and everything are correct. Well, we don't have on this system there is no data, so there is no there is no control file. There is nothing for it to do. We can't get that. We can't go to the next phase yet. Uh, and that's fine because we're going to in our in our data guard setup we're going to restore all that information from the production system. Uh, so <clears throat> the next thing we're going to do is we're going to connect as RMAN. and it is possible to connect 
to do this from the production system, but it's much easier to do this from the standby system. And uh, the reason for that is that if you uh, if you look at the listener, uh, let's go over to the, the production system. So the listener on the production system is running. It knows about Oracle. Oracle dynamically registers itself with the listener. Anytime you start up an Oracle instance, it will register itself with the listener once it gets into the mount state. This one is not in the mount state, so, it, so the listener doesn't even know that this one exists. So it is, it is possible to tweak things so that you can connect to a mounted database, kind of, from a remote system, but it's just a lot easier to do this from the, from the standby system. Uh, there are certain setups for data guard where you have to do the product, you have to do the duplicate from the production system, particularly from an active database. Uh, rather than, and, and that's a that's kind of an advanced technology where instead of doing a backup and then restoring it, uh, our man will uh, will will kind of do an over the wire uh, copy uh, directly from the production system to the standby system without an intervening backup. You should be doing a backup anyway, so that doesn't really buy you a lot, but, uh, but so it's a lot easier to just do it from the standby system. So we're going to run our man. And uh, so <clears throat> we're going to connect to the, the other system, or to the, uh, we're going to connect to the production system. And then we're going to also connect to the auxiliary system, which is, is the, um, the duplicate. The terminology gets a little confusing. Target for RMAN means the production system. And auxiliary is the one that you're going to go to. And I know that gets confusing. A lot of people say, well, target should be what the, uh, is the one that you're going to. And that's just that's the terminology that Oracle has decided. So, It's also possible to connect to a repository here, um, but that uh, but we haven't set one up for this demonstration. So our man will echo back. It shows us that the, data, the target database that we're connected to is ORCL, and it has a unique database identifier for it. And it tells us also that we're connected to the auxiliary database, which is not mounted. And that's, again, important, because if it was mounted, we couldn't restore the control file, so that we have the control file open. So <clears throat> the next thing that we're going to do in this very simple setup is a very simple command. And all we have to do is just tell it to duplicate the target database. Now, our man can duplicate the target database and have an exact copy of it, but then it diverges. <clears throat> and so then you could give it a different name. But this is going to stay ORCL. We're going to keep this as the, as the database because we're going to run this as a standby database. So we're going to duplicate our target database for standby. Um, if you had your own data file names and you wanted to copy those exactly over, our man won't recreate, won't over, overwrite data files. And so uh, it's possible to set up a, a, a data guard on, this, on a single system, which uh, so if you had your own names and you were on a different system, you could tell it to not do that file name check. We're on a different system and we're using Oracle managed files, so we don't have to worry about that. So that's really that's the whole command right there. Just duplicate target database for standby. <clears throat> so what it's going to do is it's going to go use the target database control file. In the target database control file, the, the, uh, the control file has a record of all the backups that have been done. So it's going to recognize that there was a, um, there was a control file, uh, uh, a standby control file copy made. So it's going to set up the control files where they where they go. It's going to um, restore that control file. So um, it kind of ran over, but that that ORCL CTF can, uh, 
uh, standby control file backup that we made. It's going to restore that. It's going to restore that to the location that were specified in the parameter file. So then it did that. Then it goes ahead and mounts the database. So once it's restored the control file, it's going to open it up and figure out where every other file needs to go. <clears throat> then we're going to uh, create new names for each of these data files. Again, if you had your own, if you're managing your own data file names, you would either have to do that manually or <clears throat> tell it not to do a file name check, just use the same name as it existed in the previous one. And uh, <clears throat> then it's going to start restoring. So uh, that's where we are right now is, is we've, we've created new names for this. We started our restore. <clears throat> this is a, a you know, trivially small database, so it, it didn't take very long for it to restore. Just finished that. It's now updating the control file to tell it about these new names because these are Oracle management files. They're going to have different names on the different systems, um, but they will be exact byte for byte copies. The duplicate's done, so we now have um, an exact copy of the database. So back to our, uh, let me go back to our slide. We've got this now. We still don't have RFS or MRP started and we don't have any standby redo logs. So we need to, at the very minimum, what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to get those processes started and uh, let that stuff transfer over. Now, uh, so we'll go back into SQL Plus. And uh, <clears throat> at this point, we can, um, we'll tell it to turn on that uh, the manage recovery process. So we're going to alter the database. And if we were just doing this manually, we could say alter database, and then uh, we just tell it to recover, which would be replay the log file. And we could tell it each individual log file to do. Uh, but again, the managed recovery process is going to do all that for us. So we're going to tell it alter database recover, and we're going to tell it to do it with a managed standby. <clears throat> if I just stop the command right there, it would work, but um, I'd have this. It would be running within this session, and so if I logged out, then it would stop. So I'm going to tell it to do that. And, and disconnect from the current session. Now if we, uh, so now, and now the MRP process is running, and uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. We can see that. So if we look in the V dollar managed standby um, view, we see that the MRP process is running, and it's waiting for log number two. Now we have not set up 
FAL between the two systems, and we could do that where it would, it would know this. This system, the, uh, the, uh, the primary system has actually advanced beyond that, but uh, it, it doesn't know. The, production, the standby system doesn't know that yet. Um, So the uh, the current the current log that's going that's being written to right now is sequence number four. So log number two and log number three have both been archived. But it ha but um, even though this is is uh, ready to see that it hasn't it doesn't know it doesn't know that it's it's available yet. Um, and the reason is, is that we haven't set up. Uh, oops, I'm sorry. Go back to the right slide. We haven't set up this process. Right now, archive and log writer are just writing locally. Neither of them is writing to the RFS. So to get that moving, we need to set up um, we need to set up the, the, the either archiver or uh, log writer to, to be copying those files, writing those files to the RFS system. Um, <clears throat> Now, there's a couple of different ways to do that, but the easiest way is to use DataGerd Broker. So, um, right now, DataGerd Broker is turned off, and it'll be turned off as, here as well. So, again, this is set to false. So, we can do this with grid control. But again, that there's more involved in setting up a grid control system, and we, we haven't done that for this demonstration. There's also a command line version. Now again, this has to be done from the production system. You have to set up a data guard broker on the production system. The first thing that we have to do is we have to create a configuration. Right now we don't have any configuration. So if we were to show there, there's no configuration set up right now. So we have to create a configuration. And we'll just call it DG. <coughs> All right, so we're creating a name for our configuration and telling you what the name of our production system. By default, we're going to set that to our uh, DB unique name. That's really the best way to do it. But, um, other ways, it gets a little bit confusing. And our connect identifier is going to be our, uh, <coughs> our network name in our TNS names file. So we've got prod set as the production system and STBY as the as the standby system. So we're going to create that. Oh, I'm sorry. I need to start it in SQL Plus. And we'll do that over here as well.
<clears throat> now, as that does things, that is going to start modifying the SP file. We're going to start creating uh, different online destinations. Uh, and we'll go look at our parameter file, or we'll go look at our parameters after we're done with this and see how it's different. Um, but again, so if, if we look at um, uh, <clears throat> so we've got our archive destinations that are, but the uh, the log archive desk is they're all set to enable, but none of them are created. The only thing that we have is our database recovery file destination, which is set to this repo. Um, so by default, our archive logs are going to be created in that directory. But we don't have anything for saying, let's send it to RFS as well. Again, this parameter file was created exactly from the exact, from the other. So this is what the this is what the the um, <clears throat> the settings were in the, in the production as well. <clears throat> Once we've created the configuration, we can show it. All right, so here's our configuration. We have a, uh, a primary database. That's our failover is um, that's when the broker will decide when to fail it over. So you can either enable that and allow the software to decide the production is down, we're going to switch over, we're going to fail over to the standby. Or you can um, leave it disabled and, and do that manually. Um, and the configuration is disabled because there's only a, production, a primary system. There's nothing else there. And our protection mode is max performance, which is what it is by default. Uh, max performance is going to use the archive process to transfer the archive logs um, because you're going to have the least amount of hit on the performance of your um, primary database by doing this. There's two other modes that you can set it up. You can set it up as <clears throat> max availability, which uses the archive or uses the log writer to write immediately to the standby system as as it's writing to the production system. But, uh, and, and that means that each transaction gets written to the standby as soon as it's written to the production system. Um, both of those, max performance and max availability, allow things to run asynchronously. So if there's a network hiccup or the standby gets down, it won't halt the database on the production system. The other mode is max protection. Now, if the database, if the standby database goes down or the network goes down, those transactions obviously aren't getting written to the standby, which means that if you then lose your production system, you've lost transactions. Whatever didn't get transferred over is now gone. Uh, <clears throat> Max protection says, you know, this is really, really important that we don't lose a single transaction. Typically, that's used in like banking applications, where um, it's absolutely important that nothing gets lost and you're going to pay for the infrastructure to make sure that your network doesn't go down. And you might have two or three standbys and you make sure that, that there's no way that they're all going to go down. Excuse me for a moment. But um, the downside of the max protection is that it won't allow that transaction to commit on the production system until it's trans until that transaction is transmitted to um, at least one of your standbys. So uh, for the most part, we want to run either in max performance or max availability. Anyway, once we've got the configuration created, we're going to need to add the additional standby database. So we're going to add database. Thank you. 
So Data Guard Broker is currently writing the, the parameter changes. It's connecting to the standby database, trying to make sure that it can connect and, and take care of all of them. And I think I forgot to shut off the firewall on this one. So I think that's what's hanging on. Andrew, while you're looking at that, I just wanted to let people know we have about eight minutes left before the top of the hour. And if there's any questions you want to try and squeeze in before uh, before we wrap up, now would be a great time to send those in. And um, and we'll keep an eye on those as, as Andrew moves towards the wrap-up on the demo. <clears throat> As it's working, uh, sorry I didn't get that squared away uh, the way that I should have. I, I apologize for that. But it, it's a convenient uh, way for us to see that it is. It, uh, I told you before that even if there was a hiccup, uh, Data Guard can can pick up from that. So. While we're running that, we can also go in and we can copy over uh, those uh, the the control or the um, archive logs as they got as they had gotten written out. So um, from the standby or from the production side, we still have these. Um, We've got these archive logs that I've gotten created. This one, I, even though this is an odd Oracle managed file name, I can right there is the um, the sequence number. This is log number two, and this is log number three. So we can copy these over. And again, as long as we put them in the same location, I guess that one's. I guess they. Oh, I, I guess I did robocopy those over. So they're already there. Um, <clears throat> so now what I can do is I can go in on the product on the um, on the standby. I'm sorry. Tell the database that this log file exists, and then when we go back and do our uh, and, and query that, <coughs> we see that it's already applied log number two, and it's now waiting for log number three. So again, <coughs> get your data guard broker set up so it's got the uh, it's it's pushing. Uh, so it, it automatically set up your parameters um, to the RFS, 
and uh, that, that works out very well. But even if something fails, the data broker process fails or whatever, it's really very easy to get the log files over there and re-register uh, re those with, uh, with DataGuard and with the managed recovery process and allow it to continue applying those logs. So um, <clears throat> that's, that's it for the demonstration. Um, Great job, Andrew, and, and uh, we did put a reminder out both in, uh, in chat and my comments a few minutes ago for questions, and so far none have come in, so um, that, that's likely due to the fact that with 14 years of Oracle experience, you've made this look easy, um, and, and so I think it was a good, a good overview and a good intro, but we do still have just two or three minutes left, so if anyone wants to try and squeeze in a, a question, um, we'll try and, and take it as we wrap up here. Um, Andrew, any, I guess one thing I, I might ask is, uh, maybe on behalf of the audience, is after seeing um, this, this presentation and, and demonstration, what would, what would be a next step for folks from here um, in either learning more or, or moving towards uh, implementing this on their own? Well, um, you know, you can set up a, a, a planning system for yourself and, and try to go through the steps that we've done. Uh, webinar is going to be available uh, on our website, so you guys can watch it again if, if you didn't take uh, notes or whatever, uh, kind of to get an idea. Um, you can, uh, if you wanted to, uh, you know, obviously Studio can help you to, to set up um, a, an environment for this. Uh, we could, you know, talk to you about what kind of environment you needed to do where we can help you actually uh, implement it. But, um, you know, again, the biggest thing to make this relatively easy is to make sure that they're, they've got a standby system that's, that's set up exactly the way that their production system, systems is set up. And if you do that and you're not doing any of the, the really complicated um, features of, of DataGuard, it really, is, it really is fairly simple to set up. And uh, so it does keep, a, a, you know, it does do a lot of that stuff for you automatically. Great. Well, seeing, seeing that there's, there's no other questions coming in, um, I want to make sure that our attendees and anybody that might watch the recording of this know that uh, um, you can contact us if you've got, if you've got questions. And uh, Andrew, if you want to put that last slide up, uh, we'll give you a little bit of instruction to folks on how to, how to contact us. Um, and you can uh, call, obviously, anytime. Uh, we've got the, the 888 number that you can call to and uh, uh, let the folks who, know, who answer the call uh, know what you're looking for and they'll direct you to the right person. Or an email to info at extivia.com will uh, we'll get routed um, to the right person based on your question as well. So um, again, feel, feel free to go check out uh, uh, more about Extivia at extivia.com and our virtual DBA website, which is virtual-dba.com and you'll get a good idea of, of uh, our offerings beyond DataGuard and Oracle. And Andrew, I just want to thank you. I know you, you've spent a lot of time over the past couple of weeks, and I know that especially the last couple of days finalizing preparations for this. Thank you for doing that. Uh, I'm sure I speak for our audience who uh, uh, we can see was quite attentive throughout the, the webinar, and uh, appreciate your time uh, today. And with that, we'll wrap up. and. Uh, and uh, look forward to, to seeing on the next webinar. And uh, we do send, send those notifications out uh, as those get planned. But keep an eye on extivia.com or virtual-dba.com, as well as our Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter pages that you can connect to via the extivia.com websites for announcements about upcoming webinars uh, on a variety of topics. Uh, we'll look to see on, on some of those future webinars. Thanks again for your time.